Hey, Tested. Um, I'm not turning into a prawn. This is one of my favorite props from one of my favorite movies, District 9. Uh, and we are lucky enough here in San Francisco to have recently received a branch of the Alamo Draft House Movie Theater, famous for showing first-run films, but also independent films, crazy double features, midnight movies, everything related to the love of cinema happens at the Alamo Draft House. And, well, I reached out to them and I've been doing some programming at our local branch. Uh, we've been talking about things to do and the first thing we did was to bring Neil Blomkamp down from Vancouver here to San Francisco to screen for us, tested and San Franciscans, District 9, one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, and then Neil sat down with me for a 45-minute Q&A on stage post-watching the film, and we talked about all things District 9, how it got made, the process, the procedures, all of that. Neil's an amazing interview, had a lot to say about it, and, well, I don't need to talk about it anymore because you're about to watch it. I'm not going to shoot that prawn! That was intense. I, I was, that was telling, intense. I was telling Neil uh, back there that uh, when my wife and I first watched this movie, we got to the point where Wickes is going to have to shoot the prawn. And it, we found it so disturbing. We had to pause the movie and kind of walk around our house talking about whether we could take the next bit that's going to happen. We ended up going to bed and watching it for breakfast the next morning. Right. So it's like... I really like your film. Uh, we turned it off and went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you were saying it's been a couple of years since you sat through District 9. How, how was it? How was your experience of watching it after that time? Uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, yeah, I've seen pieces of it, you know, over the last few years. But this was the first time that I think I've seen the full film in a really nice setting like this in, in about two years. And it was, it was cool. I mean, there was... I think more what happens to me is I remember shooting each event, you know what I mean? So it's like, you're sort of evaluating the film, like, oh yeah, I like, I like the pace, I like this character, I like that, I don't like that. Um, but for me, it's like I remember each of the events, and I remember what I was doing and what I was thinking, and like, it's, it's an interesting psychological experiment. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you guys shot this under some pretty difficult conditions in South Africa. You shot it in Johannesburg, in one of the townships, in, in a place in, near so in Soweto. We so did. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when, when films go right, when something about them works, there's something about them that mimics, uh, it, there's a reflection of reality happening in it, right? Like beyond sort of what you can control. And the whole movie for me grew out of um, growing up in South Africa and sort of my, my experiences growing up as a kid are reflected very accurately in the film in terms of how I feel. But the, the really interesting thing was we needed to move this fictitious group of aliens from District 9 out into a different area, which is the whole scene that Vickers goes in and begins, you know, evicting them. And what happened in, in real life was the, the ANC, like Mandela's party in South Africa, that, that's the ruling party, was moving a whole bunch of people from a, a totally impoverished area. Like Soweto is fairly impoverished, but it's not as bad as it was in the 70s or the 80s, like during apartheid. But there's areas in Soweto that are completely, you know, just, just destitute. And that, the area that this whole movie was filmed in is called Shiawelo, inside Soweto, which is extremely poverty, you know, just uh, economically depressed, like beyond belief. And they were moving all of the residents into RDP housing, which is like government subsidized houses. And many of the residents didn't want to go. So we inherited this, essentially like a back lot that had been created out of a forced resettlement of the people inside of it. You know, so it's like that, that kind of mimicry, that kind of like, they're doing what we're fictionalizing right. is, is an interesting, it, 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 it means that you're touching on something that's actually there. Right, there's a, there's a bit of violence already in the setting that you're filming in. Yeah, there is, there is. And there's increasingly more, you know, the, the, the way, I mean, South Africa's politics are so complex and so ever-changing and sort of rooted in this, in this, in a, in a very complex, multi-layered history that it's always changing and evolving. And the, the really strange thing that's beginning to happen now is like with, with the ANC and, and with Mandela's the, the remnants of the party that he left behind, there's starting to become a lot of similarities with, with how apartheid played out. You know, like the Marikana mine shootings and the, the, the sort of the impoverished that are getting like tear gassed and sprayed down with water cannons and, and that kind of thing. 
Um, so let's talk about the, the genesis of District 9. You started with a film, I remember the day it hit the internet, Alive in Joburg, a yeah, short right. film, five, six minutes long. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the genesis of that film, what your intention was? Yeah, I mean, at that point in, uh, in my career, I wanted, to, I wanted to get into directing feature films. And I was directing, um, I was directing commercials. I had begun directing commercials. And uh, I think it was a combination of, I always just want to be doing the most creative thing that I can be doing. And at the time, I wasn't really loving commercials and I wanted to be doing more creative stuff. And I also felt that if I was doing pieces that were entirely my own, it would, it would help me get into a position to direct feature films at a, at a, at a, you know, a quicker velocity than doing commercials that every other director was doing. You know what I mean? So it was like, do a Nike commercial, but do something that, like pay the bills with that, but like be much more representative of yourself or like artistically what you know, your, your, your interests are, or even beyond that, just an expression, like kind of painting you know, on, a, on a canvas. So I took any available money that I had, and I, I also went to my commercial production company and asked them to pay for that short. And I was like, you know, it, it was, what was happening at the time in South Africa was that there was mounting tension with Zimbabwean and Mozambican illegal immigrants in South Africa. So impoverished black South Africans were beginning to feel like these other nationalities in South Africa that were crossing the border were taking the few remaining jobs from them that, that they had. And uh, it, it's just a powder keg situation. And it was like, there were elements of it that I found fascinating. And then there was the whole like elements of my childhood in it as well that I also found interesting. And I just wanted to make something that sort of expressed that. I actually didn't think anyone would get it, except maybe a few, you know, very, very few people. So I made that piece. And, and then when I went to go and direct Halo, um, with, with Peter Jackson, when Halo collapsed, I could point to that piece as like, this is what I want to make. So there was already almost like a proof of concept. And you started to develop, you, you, you wrote the film with your wife, mm -hmm. um, and you started developing the film with Peter Jackson and with Weta Workshop. Right. Um, what was that process like? What, what sort of, it's, I mean, to me, I imagine that like, if you're at Weta, they're opening up the world's largest toy box for you mm -hmm. to play with. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, what happened was I, I had this rule with myself where I was like, whenever I looked at directors that I liked that had kind of gone into like the wrong version of the, the giant studio mechanism and had done some faceless massive film, I always didn't like that as much as some other piece that they'd done. So I was like, don't, don't get into a situation where you get offered something really interesting and, and large and big where you're just gonna get like, you know, meat grinded into like the next young director that just made this horrific film. Don't do that. And then my agent was like, Peter Jackson wants you to come down and direct Halo. And I was like, yeah, I'm going. Like, I'm in, you know. <laughs> and, and then I knew, I remember like, I was in New York and I was like, I was there for a meeting about, uh, actually about District 9, about Alive in Joburg. And you know, I was like, I think I can make this into a film with the studio in New York. And my agent was like, yeah, Jackson saw Alive in Joburg and he says that he wants you to do Halo, so you should go and see it. And they were like, they'll tour you around Weta. And I was like, I knew instantly that there was like, I wasn't gonna be able to get out of that. Like as soon as I was there, I would just love everything. That's exactly what happened. So, and then I spent six months making Halo and then the rug got pulled out, so. And you'd made some short Halo films that also, that. Uh, that, that was slightly different. What, what happened there was I, was I was in the process of making the feature film and Microsoft was involved to some degree in making the feature. You know, obviously it's their, it's their IP and they were, they were involved. And while we were doing the feature, when it was sort of like rocky, like it was not clear what the studios, like which way it was gonna go, Microsoft was like, do you wanna direct um, basically like these, these commercials, you know, that are kind of like weird short films that are for the launch of Halo, I think Halo 3. And I was like, yeah. Like it was just a way to kind of like dip my toes back into, production while I was kind of waiting to see what would happen with the film. So those actually came after, long after I was in production on the movie. I mean, we'd spent millions of dollars on like vehicles and wardrobe and like built stuff. And we were in the process of doing that when I was doing these little pieces. And Guillermo del Toro had actually also directed Halo prior to me. So there was like a whole banner of like Guillermo's artwork as well, you know, like it was, it was amazing. Um, I want to talk about your collaboration over several films with Charlton Copley. Um, your history with him goes back, you were 16 when you first met him. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, he was, he was out of high school as, pretty much as I entered high school, he left high school. 
And I had a teacher who uh, who was on the was on the, he was he was like a sort of like art slash science teacher who was on the brink of like figuring out 3D animation and computer graphics and stuff. And he was like, I had a total interest in that. And he was like, there's a kid who just left school who wants to start a company doing this. So you guys should meet up. And so I was actually never in high school at the same time, but like, you know, it's standard six, which I think in this country is grade eight, right? And I met Shaw at that point, but he was a lot, at that time he was perceived to be a lot older than me. And uh, I, I started hanging out with him and all of his film friends that were making, they were making their version of Alive in Joburg, where they had very little money and they were making whatever they could. And uh, we just, you know, as that age gap closed, like by the time I left to move to Canada at the end of high school, we were just like peers. And that was, and then that was an ongoing relationship where he, he actually was a director and a producer and more of a, more of a producer really than anything else. And I had asked him to produce another test for District 9. So we, Alive in Joburg got people behind it enough to pay for it. And then in the process of paying for it, it's like, what does the look look like? What is the style, you know? And I, I was the one pushing it. I was like, let me shoot a little bit more. Let me shoot another piece that can explain it even better. And so there's a whole other, like somewhere between Alive in Joburg and District 9 film that exists, which is where the character of Vickers was kind of born. Um, and I, he was always the most kind of Eddie Murphy character, kind of larger than life personality if you go and hang out with him, that, you know, he's very... Shalto it. Shalto, yeah, he's very kind of... He's like a performer, but he didn't know he was a performer. He thought he was a producer. <laughs> <laughs> and he literally didn't know. And I made this... I, the, the, the shirt, the, the bulletproof vest that's in the movie, it says MNU with his calculator. I made that. I made a different version of it, and I wrote his name on the back, Vikas van der Merwe. And I gave it to him for this piece that we shot that was a test. And I was like, you're going to play this character in this piece... And I explained this kind of Afrikaans character from like Southern Johannesburg and stuff. And he was like, what are you talking about? And we filmed it and we went back to New Zealand and Pete was like, Pete Jackson was like, that guy is like awesome. Like you, you have to put that guy in it. <laughs> and it, and I, I was like, I wanted to do that, but I, did, I had, I thought it was impossible. Like we had a $30 million film, you know, it was like I was given this break and then on top of it, I was going to put my friend in as the lead. You know, like the whole thing was like ridiculous. Who had like, never acted before. Who Never acted. The whole thing was just totally ridiculous. <laughs> and am I right? He improvised most of the actual lines of dialogue. He yeah. has. Yeah. I, I mean, most is 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 accurate. I would almost say all. But I think there were <laughs> there were specific things. Like what what we did was the script that we had. Um, I would talk with him every morning, right? And we had this thing. I would always describe it as the intent. I, I always said like, what is the intent of the scene? If you look at the scene on you know page twenty one, what is the scene trying to convey? And if there's dialogue, you know, there's dialogue that's written, maybe like one every 10 pages, it'd be like, okay, this line conveys it in a way that I know I'm gonna like. Where the other nine pages, it's like, you're, you're winging it and just going with the flow is gonna come, because of his talent in that department, is gonna come up with something probably more compelling. And that's exactly how it played out. So we would speak about the intent, he would improvise it. Usually it would be like a lot of like gold nuggets, but the improvisation would be too long. And then the next take would always be shorter, but I would tell him which gold nuggets to keep. And then the third one was like, bang on, and then you would move on. So this is another layer of what would seem to me to be impossible to convince a studio to get behind, which is your first break, your friend, the producer, non-actor is going to yeah, start yeah. it, and he's just going like, to improvise it's like a, everything. It's like a perfect storm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get a first-time director with his best friend, and they'll improvise all the lines. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a recipe for success. And special <laughs> effects heavy. How do you maintain... I mean, <laughs> you, have, you have elements that have to be maintained because you're going to do post effects on them. How do you maintain an improvisational atmosphere at the same time as being able to mm -hmm. layer in the effects you're going that, to have? That's actually it's actually much easier than it sounds. It's actually not that hard. If you if you set up the process around visual effects correctly in the beginning, like the way that you're going to approach, I mean this was that was in 2008, so it's a little bit it's even easier today, but like the, the, what, the biggest stress to me on District 9 was actually shot count, visual effects shot count, right? Like if you, if you average, say, $15,000 to $25,000 per shot, and you have 1,000 shots, you know, equals X million dollars. So, and when you're on a tighter budget, like this was a really tight budget for what we were trying to pull off, um, you, 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 have a, you have a mental number of the amount of shots that you have, right? And it's not really the execution of the shots, it's like, 
I better edit this in a way that like I'm not I'm not going over that shot count because that's going to be a real problem. So we set up a process where it would be you know roughly this cost for a very complex shot, roughly this cost for a complex one, medium and easy. And I and, and having a background in VFX, I would kind of know like you know if if Christopher Johnson grabbed like a bottle of brandy and doused himself in like liquid for like 20 minutes and then set himself on fire, that shot's expensive. <laughs> You know, and like if Sholto walks behind an alien creature for like 20 frames, that's pretty cheap. Like all we have to do is cut Roto, you know, on, on something or the inverse of that. So that was much more stressful than the, than the day-to-day -day execution of visual effects. The day-to-day -day execution was much more like directing a normal film. Like we set it up in a way where he could speak to Christopher Johnson, the actor who played him, Jason Cope, like it was a normal actor. You know, and I could direct it like it was a normal actor. So there was no like tennis ball kind of situation. It was just, and now this is, this is now today a day-to-day -day process. This right. is like a guy in a gray suit and everybody just communicates like it's normal. Now, the other thing that I find really astonishing about this film is that more than almost any other film, the effects f have a tremendous veracity because of the handheld work that you're doing and the combination of news footage, surveillance footage. Um, and our mutual friend Greg Broadmore, who designed a bunch of the weapon, all the weapons in District yeah. Nine, he's an amazing designer. He said, "And the mothership." And the mothership. He told me that he's never worked with a director more willing to throw away expensive piece, expensive set pieces at the spur of the moment if they don't work in the scene. And I mean, that's sort of the thing I notice mm. is, is that there's so much detail in the, mm. in the exosuit and the mothership that you barely, it's like you right. only are touching tiny pieces of that. Is that that's, something you intended at the very outset? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's what makes it feel real. I, I always said that. Like I said, like if you, do, if you do visual effects and you put them up on a pedestal and you go like, oh, visual effects, then people are like, <laughs> yes, I know. And if you just, if the camera just glances by it, you're like, wait, what was, what was that? That felt extremely real to me. Do you Again, think this, is, this is like now, this is not that cutting edge now. This is like more day to day. But like, you know, shooting it in 08, that was a little bit more like, you're going to spend what amount of money to pan over the visual effects? Yeah. But do you think that, I mean, I imagine that directors become enamored of this thing that they've spent nine months uh, designing an exosuit, so they want to show off a feature they particularly yeah. liked. How do you keep from getting... Uh, uh, attached to those details you've labored over? Um, I think, it, again, it just comes back from, you know, it, it, it goes back to a place of just wanting it to feel real. And the more, the more you don't emphasize something, the more real it becomes. It depends on the application. Like, this, this is a very verite kind of movie that you want it to feel like a documentary. You want it to feel like this is a day-to-day -day thing. On a thematic level, I mean... It was really interesting watching it again because like thematically, I think the thing that works about District 9 is everything is woven together on a thematic level. So the visual effects and the approach to visual effects complement actually what the themes of the movie are. And the themes of the movie are that the people of Johannesburg and of the world are tired of the aliens. They're used to the aliens. They're familiar with the aliens. It's not, what is this? This is the first time I'm seeing this. You know? So it reinforces the themes. It's as normal as a burning building in a, in a bad section of town yeah. in, in terms of the news. Yeah, exactly. Do you think that that's one of your strengths as a director is coming from the visual effects side? You deeply understand how to integrate that with the theme you want to explicate? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, executing the VFX is, is definitely one of the easier things. I mean, the more, the more difficult thing is, is making, is, is on a conceptual level, really, is, make, is, is coming up with things that are linked, you know, that... To, to that degree, that they're just fabrically like interwoven with one another. So the conceptualization, I think, is, is the most difficult part. Um, now, the film operates on so many different levels as social commentary. How much of that is intention from the very beginning, and how much of your understanding of that social commentary uh, comes alive during the process of making and editing the film? I think there's happy accidents that maybe happen in post-production, but I'd say like 95% of it, you should have an idea of what you're trying to do. You know, like, I mean, there's, there's unpredictable um, responses to it, but your idea going in should be pretty, should be pretty steadfast. Uh, you know, like, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of risky decisions, I think, in District 9. Like, the idea that the aliens are kind of, you know, that, that they're actively not... Um, that they're kind of repulsive to some degree and that they, they visually look very different from us, right, is, is a very risky thing to do. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, like, you have, 
like we look different, but you have to look beyond that to find out that actually the, the humanity is, is interlinked between each of us. And there's, there's like 10 decisions like that in the movie that it, like watching it with an American audience and watching it with a South African audience is actually very interesting because if you watch it with a South African audience, the very first shot of Vickers, they'll be laughing their heads off like hysterically, right? Because they understand the character where in North America, like I had one film financier who described it as like, he's like, is this a good Nazi movie? Because I hate good Nazi films. <laughs> right. And it is to some degree. I mean, you know, that is exactly what it is, right? Yeah. It's like, it's an oppressor who's forced to walk a mile in the shoes of someone he's been oppressing. And um, that's a very powerful concept. Like, but you, you, I think because I'm coming at it from the right place, like I'm coming at it from that under all of that, we are all human. And I'm trying to say like something that was, that was in me from growing up there. Ultimately, I know it's gonna come out the right way, but the decisions in, in like a highly politicized environment can, can go awry, you know, in, in, a, in a nanosecond. And like, I almost got banned from Nigeria for this film. How you know? come? Um, the Nigerians weren't happy with, uh, you know, with, with, with how stuff was portrayed. And it's like, fair enough. But, <laughs> but the, the intent is that in, you know, in South Africa and growing up in South Africa, like Muti, as they refer to in the film, which is, which is like um, the, the sort of the witch doctory around consuming pieces of anything, dog, human, whatever it may be, that can bring about supernatural outcomes to what you want, you know, like in a voodoo sense. Um, was I really wanted that to be in the movie because it's part, there's, there's an element of like African culture and how that intersected with apartheid and what my upbringing was that I didn't want to like not have in there. Um, but that's exactly what I mean, you know, like if you watch it as an outsider, like what the goal was, was to try to like you say, it was, try to talk, it was to try to talk about the idea of like a European force meeting a force that they were unfamiliar with. And how do you strip away the levels to figure out where you are similar and where you really are the same. And I thought the only way that you can do that is by layering these layers on top that separate us, you know, and that are different. So. I, I, I noticed watching it this time that the aliens become less repulsive through the course of the film. Yeah. I, by the end, I'm looking at Christopher Johnson's face and I see all this emotion right. and intelligence. Um, and I, I, I wasn't paying attention at the beginning to seeing whether you were intentionally guiding me towards that. Were you, did, you, did you have a progression of the way the aliens were shot that helped bring that about? Um, it, yeah, it, wasn't, it definitely wasn't how they looked um, that changed. But what, what did change was the idea that, they, that, that, that there was a lack of, um, of leadership, that there was an aimlessness about like a cohesive uh, political structure, that the political structure had been broken, and that the, the human force, AKA you know, some version of apartheid, had had damaged an infrastructure that created a way to build. So, so people were aimless, you know, and that was important. And that, that aim came into focus as you start narrowing in on people that are like trying to figure out how to get out of this. Um, I'm thinking specifically, uh, I found a wonderful quote by you. I'm gonna try and pull it up here. You said, um, the amount of different ideas in different places I wanna go through the duration of making one film means by the time you end that film, in my opinion, you... Where did you find this? I found oh, this... Uh, where is I, this from? <laughs> uh, I think it was a film, a film website. Let's okay. see. The amount of different ideas in different places I want to go through the duration of making one film means that by the time you end that film, you have no idea what you want to do. During the making of it, you only know at the end. Yeah. I'm not referring to the movie, though. I'm oh. referring to the next movie. Oh, yeah. about the, the progression of where yeah. you begin versus where you end up. Yeah, it's, it's like two and a half years is a long time. And your interests and things that happen over that period of time as someone creative will, will very often, it's kind of like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll agree to direct X. Now I'm going to make District, Ni District 9. Now I come out of District 9 and it's like, oh, shit, I agreed to do, yeah, I'm kind of not interested in that now. I'm interested in this. Oh, you know fascinating. What I mean? So, I, yeah, what I was referring to wasn't the movie that was getting made. It was like the, the, because as you're making a film, the amount of like mental notes that you're making and things that you're thinking about unrelated to the movie and sort of like while you're kind of mentally growing, you want to do as the next film. I'm just very weary of like, yeah, yeah, I'll agree to that. And then after that, I'll agree to this. Yeah, I would like, imagine. So you news. finish District 9 and all, certain, all, all sorts of offers come your way because yeah. Hollywood is so hungry for, 
for, content for, providers. for young directors. Yeah. <laughs> the, the thing is also like, I mean, Dis District 10 is a perfect example of that, you know, where it's like, um, well, once I'm working on this film now called The Gone World. So it's like once you've done The Gone World, District 10, do District 10. And it's like, I don't know where I'm going to mentally be at when I've done The Gone World. I don't know. I know might be interested I, in making I, District 10. I, I, yeah, I, I am interested in making District 10. I just want to, I just want to wake up and be like, this is the film that I'm making, you know? Like that it has as much personal, um, it resonates with me as much as the first one did. And there's beginning to become elements like that. And, you know, maybe it'll get made. Maybe, maybe I'll get hit by a truck. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. It must be, uh, it must be very intense uh, to finish after two and a half years and wrap a project like this. Is there a recovery process between one film and the next? I mean, the demand is very quickly to just jump right into the next project, right? How do you manage yeah. that creative space of taking the time to let one go? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. Like, filmmaking is difficult, you know. By the time, I, I, I think some of the most satisfying moments in your life are like when you've actually finished something and you can watch it in a theater. It's a really cool experience because it, it's like taking this period of your life and, and hundreds of thousands of decisions, you know, that are getting made, like... You're making thousands of decisions a day in pre-production, in production, and in post-production, and then you can you can just stop and you can watch it, and like that that part of your life is finished. So there's something very satisfying about that, but it's not it's not easy, you know. Like making District Nine was very difficult. It was like a very 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 difficult process. Um, but you know, if it you get back and you watch dailies like in your hotel room, and you're like, okay, this is this is for I love this. This is this is what I want to be doing. Your experience. You had experience before this film making short films, making several short films. Right. Um, was there something about going into the large format? What was the most surprising thing about the sheer size of the production when you got into District 9? Well, yeah, I mean, one thing for sure in, in terms of going into making a full feature is the level of stamina that you need, you know? Like, you, you, it's surprising, like, the amount of, of like long-term stamina that you actually need to make a film. Like, Peter Jackson directing three Lord of the Rings back-to-back -back is, is, when you start thinking about what that means, it's like, that's, that's tough. You know? He didn't lose 200 pounds by choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. It's kind of amazing. So... I remember, I mean, my, you know, in the movie, Vickers continuously refers to Trent. He's like, you know, Trent, Trent, come and look at this Trent. And he keeps calling him Trent. That's actually my friend, he's a director of photography of the movie, right? Trent Opelok. <laughs> and so Trent is a Canadian, and Trent usually has an A camera operator and a B camera operator and like a C camera operator. Like he, he did, he did, right now he did... Um, you know, he's done a lot of Marvel films, for example, right? So at that point, both of us were doing our first feature, and like, I don't think we had enough money for all the camera operators that we wanted, so Trent was also a camera operator. Yeah. So he was holding like a red camera on his shoulders, you know, with a prime lens, and like, and after like day three, on an uneven Soweto surface, which is basically, yeah. he was doing like a 12-hour cardio session, essentially, with like, you know, 20 bricks on his shoulder, he was like, dude, I'm gonna be an insurance claim. Like, I'm gonna actually be an insurance claim. And he, we, someone had to make him a special bath with like Epsom salts and stuff and like talk him down and then he like came out for day four. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and obviously we could have probably hired like another camera operator if we, if we really needed to, <laughs> I guess. But, my, but the point is, day four on a commercial or a short film, you're kind of rapping, right? And it's like, now you have another 80 days to go. Um, and then when you merge that also with the idea of like where, from a directing perspective, you are in the story, like you're shooting a scene at the end of the film, it's really emotional on day two. You know, have the actors found their grooves? Like, do you know where you are from a directing perspective in terms of like what, what you want the scene to convey? Um, and I was learning all of that in real time because that's, any, you know, everyone has to do that on their first, their first film. Um, so there was, there, was, there was a massive learning curve, for sure. Um, in writing the film with your wife, uh, as, your, as your story and writing partner, do you, were you asking her for help and helping you understand new ways the script might be going while you were shooting or rewriting things or changing uh, as it goes? Not then. I mean, definitely in the process of just writing. Um, you, you, in, every director is different, but like, I really, really dislike the idea of rewriting something as you're shooting. I think that's not a good idea. So in a, in a perfect world, you would have a really good script like way early out. Hollywood seems to like the idea of just writing something while you're shooting. Yeah, just, 
just make it up so yeah. as you go, yeah. Um, but no, it was, it, was, it was a different kind of process. Like it, it definitely wasn't a traditional process because we had what the film got financed with was a graphic novel that was halfway between a graphic novel and a script. And actually Greg Broadmore actually painted all the frames that were in that book. Oh. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't here? seen that book. Yeah. Um, so it gave the studios an understanding of like what it could be mixed with Alive in Joburg. Uh, so we had written something that was not screenplay, um, you know, uh, in its format in that scenario. But then later we did have, we did have actual, you know, a, a complete script. So no, her, her stuff would be more about like either structure or adding elements that I hadn't thought of. Like Chris, the little alien is hers, stuff like that. The little guy. I love the little guy. I love it when he matches his arm up to him. Uh, his, yeah. yeah. It's such a real thing that a kid would do. Oh, we're like... Yeah. Um, I would like to open up questions to the audience. If anybody has a question, go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, yes, sir. Go ahead and stand up and, and yell it out. That, that actually was really difficult um, because they had to be able to like emote and they had to be able to connect with you as a human. So, you know, there, there's this like unwritten rule in, in science fiction, I guess, where you bend, you bend reality to fit, and it's like they have to obviously be human to some degree. You can't do something totally unhuman and expect the audience to. Like a bowl of moss. Yeah. Yeah, like a, like a nanocloud swarm. You <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same effect. So that, they probably will have to have eyes and they probably will have to have some form of a mouth and, and, and the, 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 you know, the, the vectors that the human mind like reads for emotion. And then what, what I started doing was I just started to, there was, a, there was an artist at Weta um, who did some amazing sculpts of that concept where it was like, I knew that they were exoskeletal and they were kind of crustaceans. And... This is the other thing that's interesting about making a film like this when like you're dealing with analogy and you're dealing with like just being a science fiction kind of geek is where one ends and the other begins, you know? So it's like the fact that they come in the spaceship and the spaceship looks the way that it does and the fact that they're exoskeletal and like all of those elements, that's just pure sci-fi like nerdistry. That's not anything else. And then the elements on top of that are the ones like let's do a few visual effects tests to make sure that this actually feels like I'm into, you know, I'm, I'm connecting with this on an emotional level. And it felt like it was, so I just kept going with it. It's like that fleshy stuff around their eyes, that the tissue that makes, that makes it, um, you know, where the shells are not able to give you as much of a specific, the fidelity of what their facial structure is doesn't give you as much emotion. If you do it around the eyes and the nose and the mouth, like you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, and they had those cool little animatable mandibles as well. Chalicera, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You've been speaking to Greg. <laughs> um, other questions from the audience? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two places that that comes from. The first one is uh, because the movie is about race and it's about, you know, the... Um, the oppressive treatment of one group by another group, there's always derogatory terms for the other group. That's like a given. So I knew that we had to write something along those lines. And like I was saying earlier about concept design, on a, on a non-thematic level, I wanted them to be crustaceans. Terry, the writer with me, said that every time that she went prawn, she went, she went prawn fishing in Canada, you would bait them with cat food. So cat food and prawn both, I think, came up that way. That's awesome. Yeah. The whole cat food thing was, was because of, yeah, fishing for prawns in Canada. Well done. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe in the back there. Yes, sir. So, uh, well, I mean, one thing that I wanted it to do was to kind of never... Um, to never slow down, really, and to be, to be somewhat relentless. It was actually interesting watching it today for the first time in a few years, like how relentless it actually is. It's pretty I, relentless. Yeah, I had forgotten about how quickly it moves. The other thing that I was obsessed with in the making of the film was sound design. Like the New Zealand sound designers at Park Road Post that worked on it were, like, were amazing. And 
it's very, the sound in the movie is extremely full, right? Like it's a very like audio visual kind of experience. When Wickes is feeling nauseous, you're putting yeah. all these extra sounds in of growling and stomach. Yeah, churning. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also also just the kind of the militarized environment that it is, right? Like this, the constant sound of helicopters overhead and like these kind of polite female voices that are pre-recorded inside the yeah. armored vehicles. Like yeah. you, you have to struggle to hear them, but if you hear them, they're awesome. It's like, please remember, a smile is worth less than a bullet. It, you know, like, or it costs less than a bullet. <laughs> There's like a hundred things like that where they're reminding the, like, don't use ammunition unless you have to, you know? It's expensive. Wow. So, um, it's like those posters in the back of Brazil. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that film. Uh, so, basically, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's like, I think the main reason was really that I didn't want it to linger. Um, and because it was my first feature also, I remember, I remember Peter Jackson saying clearly, I remember him saying, you don't want it to overstay its welcome. And he was like, you know, cut it down, like cut it short, cut it tight. And we just kind of stuck to that, you know, so yeah. Um, now we, had, we were hoping today to have a double feature and you had picked a, a film that was important to you, inspirational to you in making this. Uh, and we had trouble getting the rights to show it. But what, what is that film? I'd like you to talk about it a little bit. Um, I don't know if inspirational is the right term. Like what, what happened, it was, it, was, uh, it was the inverse process. Like we knew that we were doing Alive in Joburg as a feature film and we started to watch th like, you know, just stuff that was in the vein of what we were trying to go for. And I think it may have been Fran Walsh um, who said, you should check out Bus 174. And I didn't know what it was. Uh, and, and we watched it and it was, it's a documentary made by Jose Padilla who ended up making Elite Squad and then after Elite Squad he made Robocop. And that now he made uh, Escobar with Wagner Mara. And he, he made a, he, I, he actually wasn't a filmmaker at the time. I don't remember what he was doing, but he, he wasn't to do with film. And he said he was on a treadmill, he's Brazilian, and he was in Rio on a treadmill and he watched the events of this uh, favela impoverished kid who'd taken a bus of people hostage uh, at this kind of breaking point in his life. And then there's a police unit in Brazil called Bope that's like kind of an aggressive like tactical unit that took the kid, they, they got him at the end in the bus, they got him out of the bus. And in the, you know, in the car, the classic car ride to the police station, he had died. But the documentary, the really interesting thing that the, that the documentary does that I've never really seen done before was they retraced everything about his life. So when, when Jose was like on the treadmill watching the real CNN event, he spent the next year interviewing the kid's mother. You know, I think he was 17 or 18 or something. Like all of the foster homes that he'd been in, like the people that he'd lived with in the favela. And he like builds you a profile of his life. Um, but in, in, because it's a documentary in this real verite, you know, actual documentary way. And I found that very pertinent to what we were writing. Um, so yeah, that was the film. And I think we have time for one more question. How about, yes, on the aisle. No, that was pure, that was pure sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's that distinct line between, uh, between science fiction and just pure, like I think, I think I'm a pretty visual filmmaker and there's a lot of visual stuff that I always wanna to try to incorporate in there. Um, the, the crustaceous shell color of the creature was important. And then the other thing that was important was the way that they're branded by MNU. Like they have that white paint that like someone just doused white paint across their head and then they stamp them with black paint and, and like, you know, a serial number. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, I, I, I think of science fiction as broadly dropping into either fantasy or social commentary. And of course, that's, that's Star Wars versus Star Trek. Star Wars is a utopian social commentary. This is very much a dystopian social commentary. Right. Are you an optimistic person or are you a pessimistic person? <laughs> you seem kind of pessimistic about sort of human both. nature. Yeah, I, I think I'm... I think I, I think about this a lot about myself. I'm not I'm not actually totally sure what my answer is, but I would say that the older I get, I'm becoming maybe 51% optimistic. <laughs> I think I think that I have a I, I think that I often see the worst in humans, uh, which isn't a great thing to say, but I often like this film is very violent, right? And that violence. Um, is a reflection of how violent the world really is. And so every, every, like watching the news to me is a very 
depressing situation. I don't know whether it hits me harder or I'm just more pessimistic. I don't know. I haven't watched the news or listened to the news radio in like five years. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So this, you know, somewhat explainable on a biological level, Darwinistic survival of the fittest thing that human beings do, like any mammal or reptile or whatever, uh, is has this kind of Janus split split white and black personality, you know, between positive and negative and like the animal self and like the reptile self and and the, the, the kind of the dominating, warring, torturing, conquering, you know, mammalian RNA, DNA strand in us. And then on, on the other side of it, you have enlightenment and philosophy and everything else. So like, I think that I kind of skip between those two and it's increasingly more difficult to kind of see like where, what I, you know, where, where I think we stand. But yeah, we haven't shed the animal in us. No, we certainly haven't. Um, will you guys please join me in thanking Neil for joining us today? Neil, thank you so much.